before I get into what exactly a synchrotron is and what does it do, I'd just like to show you a picture of one. This is the Max 4 facility, a recent aerial photograph showing the central uh, storage ring. It's a very large facility, and Max 4 is not new, unique in the sense that synchrotrons are usually very large research facilities which require funding from many different international government and in also industrial partners. But what I want you to just understand is basically synchrotrons can just act like a very intense light source or many intense light sources. And what we can do with this light is we can investigate our nanostructures and in particular for us at the NMC, our nanowire devices. So, how is this light produced? All synchrotron synchrotrons provide a means to produce electrons. These electrons are then accelerated in a LINAC accelerator up to very high speeds, very close to that of the speed of light. The electrons are then put into these large storage, ring, ben, uh, storage rings, which you saw from the previous photograph, and these storage rings allow the electrons to travel for several hours in the ring because they have very high energy at the moment. And th under ideal conditions, these electrons can even travel for several days at a time. Now, these electrons can traverse in this circular path thanks to these bending magnets, and as the electrons experience the bending magnet and turn around a corner, you get light emitted. And where this light is emitted is where you would put your experimental station in order to harness the light and use them for probing your nanostructures or whatever it is you happen to be looking at. Now, usually you would also use components such as undulators and regulars. And what these essentially are is a series of alternating magnets. And depending on the precise placement of these magnets, you can actually really con well control small changes in the electron trajectory. And what th this means is you have much better control on the sort of light which is emitted. So in this way, we can control the polarization of the light, the energy light, and in effect, the wavelength of the light. So you can tune this depending on what kind of sample you're looking at and what kind of information you want to obtain. So there are many international synchrotron facilities all over the world. These are the more common ones used for our research at the NMC. Uh, frequently we go to Soleil or ESRF down in France, Diamond Lights facility in the UK, and even ALS over in the United States. But we're very lucky here in Lund because we do have the MaxLab facility right across the road from the NMC. And this, of course, in a couple of years, we'll be able to use MAX4 as well. So we have many opportunities to perform these synchrotron-based light experiments. So now I'd just like to give you a bit of a brief overview of synchrotrons and what kind of experiments you can perform on our nanostructures. And then I'll go into each of them in a little bit more detail and give you some examples of the work we perform. So one technique we can look at is to use a light-in electron-out process. And what this does is we can obtain chemical information about the atomic species present in our sample based on the kinetic energy of electrons being emitted. Another technique we can use is a photon-in, also electron-out process, but this is slightly different where we can sort of directly map where the electrons are emitted from and obtain a direct imaging technique of it to see our nanowires in total and obtain things like the electronic structure. Uh, one other technique is to directly look at the structural information of the nanostructures via a light-in, light-out process, via diffraction or scattering techniques. And what we can do at the NMC is we also combine all of these different experiments with some scanning probe microscopy techniques that we perform at Lund University and we can really build up an atomic scale picture of the sample and look at the defects on the surface or what kinds of surfaces you have on your nanostructures. So just to go into a little bit more detail now in these techniques, the first one I mentioned was the photon in electron out process and this really gives us the chemical information of our nanostructures. So what happens here is if you can remember back to chemistry where you have this basic model of an atom where you have a central nucleus and this nucleus is surrounded by various electron orbital shells. Now the electrons in these atoms exist at various energies and we know these energies from various studies. Now what you do is when you irradiate your sample with your synchrotron light, in this case we would use X-rays, you get some excitation process occurring in the atoms of your material, and then you get electrons emitted. And what we do is we collect these electrons on a detector and measure their, their kinetic energy. And what this kinetic energy tells us is we get this 
quite, can be quite complicated chemical fingerprint, but we can attribute all the different information to the different chemical species in our nanostructures. So we can do this for, this is called XPS, electron, uh, sorry, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and we can perform this on our nanostructured devices, in particular nanowires. So what we do, we take our nanowires as they're on the as-grown wafer, we can break them off and put them onto a different type of material. For 3,5 nanowires, we would usually use a piece of silicon. And then we have this sample containing many electrons randomly oriented across the surface. And what happens is when you irradiate that with light, we get our com complicated chemical fingerprint. And this is quite a complicated spectrum, but all, all I want you to take from that is that these different peaks you can attribute to different species in your nanowires and also the underlying silicon substrate. Now, XPS is a very surface sensitive technique, so it's a great method to really get a lot of detailed information on the surfaces of our nanowires. You can see some examples of an indium arsenide nanowire on the left-hand side of the image, along with an illustration showing all the different types of surfaces which can be possible up during the growth process. So we can use XPS, for instance, to identify particular oxide species which form on the surface of your nanowires. And what we do here is we take the chemical fingerprint, zoom in on a very particular part of this, and by looking at individual peaks, we can extract information based on their energy and distribution about whether these are oxide species or due to the underlying indium arsenide nanowire. Furthermore, we can continue these oxide uh, studies and look at different processes with the synchrotron. So we can take the nanowires in the in the chamber where we're performing the synchrotron experiments, we can heat them up to elevated temperatures and expose them to hydrogen gas. And what this does is it removes oxide from the surface of the nanowires. And when, when we perform, once again, our XPS measurement, we can watch as those blue oxide peaks completely disappear. And what we can also do is with the STM studies that we perform at the university, we can build up an atomic scale picture of the nanowires after the oxides are removed. So in this way, we can get a lot of chemical and structural information on the nanowires. The second technique I'd like to talk to you about was the uh, obtaining electronic structure via a light in electron out process. This is a little bit different, whereas before we were really measuring the kinetic energy of the electrons coming out. In this way, we sort of collect the electrons quite similar to how you would collect light in an optical microscope. Your electrons are emitted from your sample, from the sample and the nanowires. They're collected and uh, focused through a variety of lenses, and then they hit a phosphor detector. And in this way, you really get a direct picture of how the nanowires look, and many nanowires at one time. So this can give us structural information, but more importantly, can also give us electronic information about the nanowires. If you consider one of the most basic active type of nanowire devices, a PN junction, to form diodes, for instance, for light emitting diodes or for solar cell nanostructured surfaces, you would have a nanowire where one part contains n-type dopants and one part which would contain p-type dopants. This is basically either an excess or absence of electrons. And what you can do with this photo, photo emission electron microscopy technique is you can directly image the nanowire and where you see that very bright region in the center here for the n-type dopant is where you have an excess of electrons. So these electrons much more readily come out of the surface. We can really see this immediately with this PIM technique. This technique has also undergone a variety of improvements over the last few years. We can image much more complicated junction structures, such as a PNPN indium phosphide nanowire, and really image small, the small gold particle at the end of the nanowire. And this technique can now be done with resolutions down to 10 nanometers. And again, once more, we can combine this with STM experiments so that we can get the structural information on the surface of how the dopants affect the nanowire growth and what the outside of the nano looks like. So then the last technique I would like to tell you a little bit about is a light-in, light-out process, which you heard a little bit about scattering earlier. And this is X-ray scattering, where we look directly with an X-ray light source at the structure of our material. So there are two different ways to do this. You can either look at the large angle scattered light, where the light has a very large scattering angle, and this is basically giving us information from the light being reflected from 
atomic planes within a material. So this gives us our very small scale structure. We can also look at the small angle scattering. And what this does is it gives us more the large scale overall structure of our samples, whether it's the size or the shape or also interaction between particles. So this te these techniques are being used for a rather new experiment at the NMC, which is in situ characterization of aerotaxi nanowires. You heard a little bit about aerotaxi earlier, but just to remind you, they're nanowires grown in a flow reactor without the use of a so supporting substrate at all. So this, these have huge potential for reducing the, the cost and improving efficiencies of nanostructured solar cells. So in this way, it provides us this really unique system to observe the nanowires during the growth process with X-ray diffraction and observe the, the change from the particles where you have your starting gold catalytic particles all the way to the gallium arsenide nanowire growth. And so far, what we've been able to achieve in this project is to look with the small angle scattering and characterize the catalytic gold particles in real time while they're flowing through the flow reactor in nitrogen gas. And for instance, using this technique, we can extract the information about whether the heated particles are nice and spherical and round and obtain their average size, or whether you have clumping and clustering of irregular particles. So we, this is a means to really observe in real time, in situ, the sort of as per as produced particles without being exposed to any outside air, for instance. So I ho hope I've shown you all the uh, many different techniques to do with synchrotron radiation This for, for nanowire structures. And this situation will actually improve quite a lot in the next couple of years. The MAX4 facility will hopefully have light in June 2016. And this will mean quite a number of things for us. It's going to have much more intense light. It will actually be the highest intensity synchrotron light in the world at that point. And it will have a number of unique experimental stations. We will, for instance, be able to perform high pressure XPS. So instead of just looking in a stepwise process before and after nanowire growth and before and after nanowire cleaning, we can watch these processes in real time. There will also be as I said, much higher intensity light. So the opportunity for looking at dilute uh, systems such as nanowires on surfaces or nanowires in a gas flow will be vastly improved. And there'll be many unique things we can do with that. And finally, there will all, because we will have these high focused end stations where the beam of light coming out will be very small, we can actually have far greater spatial resolution of our nanowires structures. So we can look instead at individual nanowires or indeed very small areas on the nanowire surface. So I hope I've convinced you that there is many different techniques you can perform with synchrotron radiation for nanostructured studies. We can obtain chemical composition, electronic composition, and structural information using these techniques. So that's all for me. Thank you. I have a question um, regarding the depths, the penetration depths of the X-rays into your sample. Do, do you get surface information only, or do you also get information about, say, let's say, the bulk of a nanowire, which is you, not yeah, very you, bulky? You, you can actually you can just decide on which uh, energy of light you want to use, and you can tune this depending on whether you want to look at just the very top surface of your nanowires, or whether you want to probe some some area into the bulk. Yeah. Thank you.